are done, so back to talk. So we start with one research talk, then we have a few introductory talks and another research talk. Our first one will be Raphael, connection between hot corinos and discs. Adios. Thank you. Well, hello, uh, everyone. Thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to give this talk. I'm Rafael Martin Domenech. I'm working here for two years now uh, as a postdoc in studying over group. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the chemistry that goes on during a star formation, and in particular about this uh, possible connection between hot corinos and protostellar disks around class zero protostars. So um, first, I'll give you a little introduction on why we care about this uh, possible connection. On one hand, uh, we have the hot corinos. Hot corinos are formed around class zero protostars, and these protostars are still embedded uh, in a dense envelope formed by gas and dust. And as we get closer to the central protostar, the envelope gets warmer, and in the innermost uh, regions, the temperature uh, the temperature reaches above uh, 100 Kelvin, and the ices on top of the of uh, the dust grains sublimate to the gas phase. So we end up with um, with um, compact region, warm compact region characterized by a rich chemistry, uh, and and in particular by the by the by the presence of complex organic molecules. So these hot corinos are harder to detect than the more massive hot cores, and only eight have been detected so far uh, toward class zero protostars. On the other hand, uh, in these class zero sources, we also have the formation of protostellar disks uh, because of the conservation of angular momentum uh, during the collapse of the pre-stellar uh, core. So uh, seven protostellar disks have, uh, have been detected toward class zero sources, and in particular, uh, two around sources that also harbor hot corneal chemistry. So this is uh, where uh, the, this possible connection of hot corneal chemistry and this uh, begin. So even though this protostar disk uh, subsequently evolved into protoplanetary disks, uh, there is evidence now uh, that the formation of planets may begin earlier than previously thought in these uh, protostar disks be because we, see, we are now seeing uh, a structure in the protoplanetary disk that uh, may be there because of the formation uh, of planets that uh, should begin uh, earlier for the structure to be there in the protoplanetary disk. So the chemical composition of the nascent planets is going to be affected by the, by the chemical composition of the disk. And this is why it is important to know the chemical composition of these protostellar disks, and in particular, uh, the, the, the inventory of complex organic <laughs> molecules in, in them. So this is the main reason why the, the possible connection on, uh, between hot corinos and disks is important to us. So here is an example of uh, one of these two sources that harbor at the same time a hot corino chemistry and a uh, protostellar disk. And recently, uh, this work found that the hot corino chemistry, the nine complex organic molecules that were detected uh, in this HH212 source, they were actually present in the atmosphere of the protostellar disk of the source. So the hot corino chemistry in this case is going on uh, in the same uh, spatial, uh, uh, in the same space as the as the um, protostellar disk is forming. So what have we done in this work? We've selected five sources in the Serpent's molecular cloud. Uh, Serpent submitted uh, one, seven, eight, 15, and 17. Uh, these sources are considered uh, protostatic these uh, candidates because they have uh, non-zero visibilities uh, at long UV distance, non-zero continuum visibilities at long UV distances. So, um, uh, this means that we have uh, dust, uh, warm dust, uh, emitting in compact, in compact regions around the central protostar, and this could be uh, uh, an evidence of the formation of a protostar disk. So why is, uh, this is why we think these sources may harbor protostar disk. And uh, uh, what we've done with, you know, with these five sources is to observe them as a um, uh, as part of the larger project aiming to study the chemical evolution 
of the during the disk uh, life cycle and we've observed these sources in band 6 with ALMA um, with 14 number spectral windows targeting particular transitions of uh, carbon monoxide, uh, formaldehyde, HCN, etc. And also two broader spectral windows but with a worse spectral resolution but still being able to cover uh, some transition of more, co uh, more complex organic molecules such as methanol or dimethyl ether. And the question we were trying to answer with these observations was whether these uh, protostatic disk candidates also harbor uh, hot carino chemistry. Uh, the answer is yes, they do. Uh, here you can see uh, on the top panels the, the, dust, the millimeter dust continuum emission, uh, 230 gigahertz of the five sources. In the middle panels, the moment zero maps of uh, C180 transition, I think it's two to one. Uh, the moment zero maps is the integrated emission over the full uh, line width, and, and you can see the spatial distribution of this molecule. And on the bottom panels, you can see that three out of the five uh, sources present compact uh, uh, methanol emission um, toward the continuum uh, emission peak. So we have compact uh, uh, methanol uh, emitting from a region uh, very close to the central protostar in three out of the, uh, out of the five sources. Um, particularly, I focused my work on the source serpents embedded one, but uh, these results also apply to serpents embedded eight and 17. And here you can see on the right uh, the spectrum, the emission spectrum uh, toward the continuum peak of the source, uh, where the central protostar is expected to be. So we detected 36 lines above four sigma, uh, corresponding to 10 chemically distinct species and seven acetabologues. And you can see here uh, that we have simpler species as uh, CO under uh, uh, its isotabologues, uh, C18 O and 13 CO. Uh, CS, uh, SO2, HCN, and we have also more complex uh, molecules. And I want to drive your attention in the detection of H2CO, uh, two lines of H2CO and one line of HDCO that is uh, here. Uh, methanol, we have four lines of uh, methanol in these two uh, uh, spectral windows. And formaldehyde and methanol are uh, considered uh, complex organic molecules precursors or class zero uh, type zero uh, comes. And we also have two complex organic molecules, uh, dimethyl ether, uh, somewhere here. We have three lines of dimethyl ether and two, uh, sorry, two uh, resolved multiplets of dimethyl ether and three lines of methyl formate. So we have two comps precursors and two complex organic molecules detected uh, toward this source. You can see here the list of all the transitions detected. We're spanning uh, apple level energies from uh, 15 Kelvin up to 400 Kelvin or something like that. Well, uh, in this plot, you have the moments you maps of all these species that were detected in the previous spectrum. <laughs> Uh, and you can, uh, you can see here the spatial distribution of all the molecules detected. So, uh, for example, uh, we uh, found that the molecules are divided basically in two groups. The small molecules are uh, mainly present uh, in extended regions uh, around the central uh, protostar. For example, CO and SIO, uh, they're tracing the outflow from the northeast to the southwest of the source. And other molecules such as c 18 and H2CO, they have both um, emission toward the continuum peak, uh, and also e emission extended over the, the outflow. So the small molecules are present extended emission, but the more complex molecule, such as uh, methanol, uh, and the two comps, dimethyl ether and methyl formate, they only present uh, compact uh, and uh, mainly unresolved emission toward the central protostar. So, uh, so far we have complex organic molecules emitting in a compact region around the central protostar. Uh, what about the temperature of, this, uh, of these molecules? Um, only for methanol, we had a sufficient number of lines spanning a wide range of upper level energies, so we could uh, build this rotational diagram here and calculate uh, its rotational temperature, it's 260 Kelvin, since uh, the other uh, complex organic molecules are emitting in the same region as methanol, we can assume as a first approximation that the rotational temperature is uh, the same. So uh, we have 
warm compact emission of complex organic molecules, and that's basically the definition of a hot Carino. So uh, we can uh, conclude that well, these sources, surplus embedded 1, 8, and 17, they have a hot Carino chemistry in them. But what about the, the protostellar disk? We were saying that, the, that these sources were protostellar disk candidates uh, because of the non zero visibilities of the continuum emission. But uh, can we say something about the protostellar disk with this uh, line, uh, with this line observations? We can say something, but not, uh, we're not pretty sure about it. So uh, here you have the high velocity moment zero maps. This is the integrated emission, but only for the high velocity channels with respect to the velocity of the source. And it's divided in the red and blue shifted emission. So you can see for only for CHTNO and H2CO, uh, especially for CHTNO, that the, that the high velocity uh, emission is distributed from red to blue shifted velocities in the direction perpendicular to the outflow that was northeast to southwest. So, and you can see that in H2CO, uh, a little bit uh, worse, and for the complex organic uh, molecules, uh, the emission was not resolved, so we cannot say uh, anything about the rotation of those uh, species. But in this case, this is a, this is a sign of uh, rotation, but rotation doesn't necessarily mean uh, um, the presence of a Keplerian disk. It could be just uh, the, the employing rotating envelope uh, uh, infilling into the central protostar. So we try to uh, to study this with the PV diagrams, the position velocity diagrams. You see here for CHTNO and H2CO, uh, there is a spin-up feature. Uh, the, the, the red um, and the blue shifted velocities are uh, uh, distributed along the, uh, the east and the west side of the source. But this could be and um, this could be explained by the red curve, which uh, is Keplerian rotation. But uh, it also it, it could also be explained by the, maybe by the orange curve, which is just in falling motion. Uh, here in the PV diagram, in the direction of the outflow, the emission is pretty uh, symmetric, and that cannot be explained by the in falling motion. So maybe. Uh, we do have a uh, protostar disk uh, going on there, but we cannot rule out the presence, uh, the contribution of the infolding rotating gas. So to conclude, we have complex organic molecules uh, in this source. We have, uh, therefore, hot colonial chemistry going on in this source. We may have uh, a protostar disk uh, also in this source, but we need uh, better observations, uh, spatial uh, resolution, and, and even uh, more um, deep observation of this uh, of this source to to say for sure, and uh, that that was all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions. We have quite a number of oxygen bearing molecules in our sample, mm -hmm. um, and for the energy, there's a later evolutionary stages, as you know. I mean, oxygen is a so, do you see any evidence for depletion, or is this just a moment CO ratio as provided? Uh, I I hadn't uh, studied the CO ratio uh, because I only focused on the um, on the complex organic molecules. So I don't know, for example, see the abundance of CO or anything like that. But um, I guess these are pretty uh, early uh, pro protostar sources. So. Uh, the, the temperatures are uh, still high for these uh, molecules, so I don't know if the, since we're probing the, like 200 a year or something like that from the central protostar, I don't know if depletion is playing a role uh, in that uh, scale. But um, I, I mean, I cannot say for sure. So I would have another question. So from the high mass side, we always look for also nitrogen bearing mm -hmm. molecules, especially metal cyanide. You didn't mention this. Is this in your setup, or couldn't even try this? Or methyl cyanide? I I don't remember if we cover. If we cover, we don't detect it. Uh, but I uh, think we don't cover any methyl cyanide transition in these uh, observations because uh, we were trying to observe them in a proposal that was not accepted in the last cycle. So, yeah. In principle, it could be, in, uh, but one would need to your narrow windows whether it's there. Yeah. Or so. No, you cannot. Yeah, it's pretty blurry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more questions? <coughs> if not, then let's thank. Oh, please. please. I was wondering, um, have um, infrared observations somehow helped to, to, to maybe try and change the surface of the disk? 
In front of the observation of these sources, um, not sure. I'm not sure actually. So this is the paper that we used to select the the DNF uh, 2011 to select the sources. Maybe they mentioned some infrared observation in this paper. I could I could look for it and and let you know later. Okay, then let's thank Raphael again. So we have four little introductory talks. So it would be good if you all could come up nearby that you can easily trans transition between the different ones. And I suppose we have time. She has this fancy timer, but we uh, just make sure you use the microphone. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Asmita Bhandare. I'm a final year PhD student at the MPIA, uh, working with uh, Thomas and Rolf. So um, going a step back in evolution from what we just heard in the previous talk, um, my work focuses on understanding how um, molecular cloud cores transition into forming protostars. Uh, we do this using radiation hydrodynamic simulations, and this is a sketch of the different processes involved in the different stages of uh, the collapse. So starting from the top left, uh, we use a 3000 AU um, molecular cloud core, which undergoes an initial phase of gravitational collapse uh, to form the first hydrostatic core, famously called as the Larsen core. Uh, this core evolves further and collapses further, and you have a second uh, core forming within this first core, uh, which then eventually evolves into your protostar. Uh, during this, uh, between the phases of the first and the second core formation, you also have disks forming uh, around these objects. And if you want to know more about how this entire process works, uh, come talk to me. We do this using 1D and uh, 2D um, hydro simulations. Uh, the advantage of 1D simulations is that we can span a wide range of initial conditions, and uh, the main uh, result from this work was that the first hydrostatic cores are uh, non-existent in the high mass regime. So for those of you looking for these in the high mass end, um, good luck. <laughs> um, and from, from the 2D studies, we 
uh, find um, owing to the highest resolution that we've achieved for the first time for these studies. Uh, we see indications of convection at these very early stages. Uh, you can scan this QR code to uh, look at a movie of the entire collapse process in 2D. Uh, this is also available on my poster, so feel free to enjoy the movie. Thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Richard Teague, I'm a SMA fellow here at the CFA. Um, I actually did my PhD in MPIA in Heidelberg, so I've now got to experience this meeting both as the Heidelberg Harvard Star Formation Meeting and now as the Heidel at the, now the Harvard Heidelberg Star Formation Meeting. Um, my interests really focus on protoplanetary disks, uh, slightly different, but I think a lot of the techniques um, can work together. So I'm particularly interested in looking at the kinematics. So in the disk context, I'm looking for deviations from Keplerian rotation, which we're interpreting as uh, unseen planets, which are perturbing the velocities. Um, I'm also looking at ways that we can extract the 3D kinematical structure of these disks. So here in the bottom right, I'm showing the sort of 2D velocity structure that we've managed to pull out of some of the D-sharp observations that are showing these collapsing flows um, that we're claiming are due to planet open gaps within this disk. I'm also interested in looking at molecular excitation, so what can we learn from line ratios and modeling things in non-LTE. Um, and I've also recently started looking at line, polariz line polarization uh, observations, so this is essentially just a lot of non-detections, but it's interesting to see how far we can really push the new instruments. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to publish the codes that I'm using, so a couple of ones that might be of interest to people here are better moments. So this is a push away from trying to use the traditional intensity weighted average velocity as a way to make moment maps, um, some slightly different ways, which I think produce nicer rotation maps. We've got GoFish, which helps you try and search for weak line emission if you know the velocity structure of the source you're looking at. And finally, Eddy, which is something you can use to measure extremely pre precise rotation profiles. So if any of those sound interesting to you, uh, come find me later. Thanks. Hi, I'm Liz Flores. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm from the MPIA. I'm doing my PhD with Mario Flug, um, running hydro hydrodynamical simulation of protoplanetary disk. This work is a bit different. It's uh, more related to uh, star formation. It's a project that I conducted when I was doing my master's in California. Um, and here we do a, uh, try to model the physical and the chemical structure of uh, class one protostar L1527. And so we know that ALMA and also KARMA uh, probes uh, continuum and spectral line emissions from, that comes from disk and envelopes from protostars. And so we try to conduct uh, this project and we break it down in three different steps. The step one, we do run a self-consistent collapse solution. And in the first image, you will see the schematic diagram of the system, of Prostar L1527, where you will see the red uh, region. It's uh, the red shifted collapsing area, and the blue, it's the blue shifted area. And we included to a outflow cavity based on uh, mid-infrared uh, observations. Um, then we used the density and the velocity profile from this self-consistent collapse solution to into the radiative transfer to calculate the temperature. And from this um, model, the acidities and get the luminosity of the protostar. So in the middle um, image, you will see the top three panels as the temperature has a function of different radius. At the center, you will see the star, but it's inclined 90 degrees with respect to the outflow cavity. So the most illuminated areas are the outflow cavities, reaching a temp high temperature of 1,600 Kelvin. The wide control line represent represents our definition of the CO snow line, uh, 25 Kelvin. The three bottom panels represents the density. Well, you will see um, the disk. Um, and so with this temperature and the density obtained from the first uh, step, we use a chemical model. Um, we use these two profiles as an input parameters to get the chemical abundance as a function of time. And so we could have modeled spectral line emissions and PV diagram to wrap up our validations of the models. So yeah, if you have a, if you're curious about more about it, then go buy my poster and I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Afternoon, everyone. And I'm Chun Jiang Ying, and I'm an undergraduate intern here at CFA. And I was working with Dr. Garrett Keating, and our recent work is blind blind search for the high redshift galaxies. So unlike you guys playing with uh, reserved sources, we just do this often to you know make most use of our data sets and get as uh, get more sources as if possible. So basically, what we do is we smooth the you know given data sets, uh, special cubes, and then select uh, voxels that satisfies the certain selection rules, and then we cluster uh, cluster uh, cluster them into sources, and we fit the lines to get the you know most likely candidates list. And we also do cross validation using multi multi wavelength survey data sets uh, from infrared to X ray survey, and unfortunately, our line diagnostic and analysis part is still in progress. So here is an interesting example of uh, our most bright, brightest uh, sources. Uh, here we detect CO43 and C1 emission, and a detailed uh, detail, uh, an an analysis to the uh, CO43 shows unexpected uh, bright, uh, bright luminosity with uh, its ratio to CO4 uh, to do one to about 0 0.5. This highly excited CO implies that the temperature of the uh, gas gas uh, is, is pretty high. So that may change its classification from a normal BZK galaxy to a dusty star formation galaxy. Uh, so this will lead to an overestimation of its total gas mass for the, uh, this classification will not only influence its CO ground luminosity, but also its conversion factor of CO2, uh, H2 mass. So if you are interested in my research, you can talk to me later. Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks a lot for all these introductory talks. So we have one more highlight talk. So that's now coming Maria Ramirez Thanos. And she talks on the origins of close-in binaries. Hi, everyone. First of all, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk. And thanks for the to j the jet lag people to stay awake. <laughs> so my name is Maria Claudia Ramirez Tanos, and I uh, started my postdoc recently at MPIA. And my research focuses on the outcome of massive star formation. Today I will specifically talk about a, a property of massive stars, which is the the binarity. But before I start, I would like to put my research into context. So as I said. I focus on the outcome of massive star formation, meaning I look for stars that are as massive as possible and still show uh, like remnants of the formation process, in this case, uh, for example, disks. Well, why massive stars? Massive stars, as you all know, play a very important role in, the, in shaping the ISM and galaxies as a whole. They, they dominate the energy and momentum budget of the ISM and they also are the progenitors of gravitational wave sources, for example. So how does my, my research relate to this? I, well, with our studies, we are able to produce the, to, to, yeah, produce the initial conditions that are used, are, are used in stellar evolutionary codes. And then these codes will give you the energy that massive stars produce and also make predictions for the amount of supernovae or gravitational sources that you need. But also, and this is what I would like to touch upon in, in these few days, uh, I would like to connect my research. So I study stars that are already formed, but I'm very interested in connected what I do with uh, these larger scales that most of you study. So you can study star formation in two ways. You either look at the very early stages, which is like what most of you do, and I'm looking at the very late stages, and I would really love to be able to connect these, these two things. So as I promised, I would like to focus on a property of massive stars that we cannot ignore, and that is 
that 70% of massive stars are found in close uh, binary systems. This means that 70% of all massive stars are going to interact with their companions. And what this makes is that massive stars are gonna become more massive, they will emit even more UV radiation, they will live longer, etc., making all the, the things that I mentioned if the, why massive stars are important, even like more like bigger. These observations that I'm showing here, or this result that I'm showing here, is based on observations of clusters that are two to four million years. And now the questions that I would like to ask is, are these massive stars actually born, 70% of them born in close <coughs> binary systems, or do, they, do these systems form like later in the evolution? So to do this, I would like to fill in this gap that you see here. We have observations of clusters that are two to four million years old. I would like to find a cluster or stars that are even younger than this. So this is what we have to do. We have to basically fill up the Hirschsprung-Russell diagram. Here you see temperature in the x-axis, luminosity in the y-axis, the CRH main sequences in the dashed line, and the, the uh, solid lines show evolutionary tracks for stars from 10 to 25 solar masses. This is when stars, they accrete a lot, then they expand, and when they stop accreting in the model, they start contracting towards the zero H main sequence. So what I want to do is to fill up this diagram. This is hard for three reasons. First of all, massive stars are rare, so they are distant. Second, they form fast, so it's difficult to catch them in that stage. And third, they, most of the time, when they are forming, they are obscured at visual or, or near infrared wavelengths, which makes it very difficult for us to study the stellar photospheres. But there's this region over here, M17, which gives us a bit of hope because it's a very luminous region. It's also relatively near, nearby. It's only two kiloparsecs away. And it has a clusters of, of all stars in the middle that seem to have been clearing their surroundings, meaning that we can see stars that are still forming around this, this cluster. So what we did, we observed 11 candidate uh, massive young stellar objects in this region with X-Shooter. X-Shooter is a great instrument, I don't know if you've you heard about it, because you see a huge wavelength range <coughs> from the near UV to the near infrared, so that allows you, if you have photospheres, to see photospheres in the, in the visual, and if you have disk, also you detect disk in the near infrared. So this is what we did. We observed these objects, we characterized, we modeled the photospheres, we detected some disks, and we managed to fill up the hirschsprung russell diagram. So from this result, we see three different kinds of objects. These are all massive stars that are being formed but we can divide them in three groups. This first group, which is stars that show both photospheres and disks in the x range, which is, which is until 2.3 microns. By disks, I mean we see double peak emission lines and also CO bandhead emission. Then we have these other kinds of sources. These are stars where we don't see any signatures of disks in the x spectrum. But if you see photometry with Spitzer or Herschel at longer wavelengths, you see that there is an infrared excess. So we think maybe they have uh, still dusty disks. And then there are these sources over <coughs> here that are just regular O stars. So uh, unfortunately, we asked only for one epoch of observations in this, in this region. So the only way that we have to to look for binarity is for look for, for this, the whole population. So we have one snapshot, and what we did was to measure the radial velocities of each of the stars, and then you can calculate the dispersion of, of your massive, of that the massive stars give you. And this is the result that we got for M17. It's only five kilometers per second. This was very surprising because, as I mentioned before, for clusters that are two to four million year old and have 70% close binaries, you would expect to observe a dispersion of 30 kilometers per second. <coughs> so M17 is quite rare in that sense. So how do we explain this very short dispersion? How do you do to go from 30 kilometers per second to five kilometers per second? You can either remove the binaries, 
And then if you remove the binaries, the dispersion that you observe is going to be only the dispersion of the cluster, the internal dispersion, or you start putting the binaries farther apart. If you put the binaries farther apart, when you take one snapshot, the velocities of these binaries are not going to be so high and no difference between them. So you can also get a, a short, small dispersion. The first thing that I told you would imply maybe that the formation in M17 is completely different from other clusters. So we are not convinced of, of that uh, hypothesis. The second thing would imply that massive stars are actually born in wide orbits, and then in a few million, year, the few million years, they can harden to, to represent the, the observations that we have now on the cluster, <coughs> older clusters. Two ways of hardening binaries would be either that you form them in, form them in a circumbinary disk that is massive enough to remove angular momentum from the inner binary so that uh, when the disk uh, absorbs angular momentum, you can harden the binary. Other way would be to form a triple system, and then the third star would help you hardening the binary. So let's make a pause. I would like to recap. We have found a population of massive stars that are say, still forming. And the second thing is these massive stars seem to have formed in, in uh, orbits that are larger than what we observe in clusters of two to four million years old. Now I would like to focus on this aspect because this uh, is important because it gives us hints about the formation of massive closed binaries. If this hypothesis, hypothesis is true, this would mean that you expect a trend of uh, the dispersion of the cluster with age. So if binaries harden, as the cluster gate gets older, you would expect the dispersions to get higher. So this is what we are trying to do now. For this, we of course need more observations. So this is uh, another um, survey that we did. We did a KMOS, KMOS observations of three young massive star forming regions. And we characterized them in terms of their stellar content. And uh, also the, then we measured the radial velocities of the massive stars. Uh, this is just an example of two of the populations because we characterize the populations, we can uh, find the ages of these regions. Then, as I said, we measure the velocities of the massive stars and the velocity dispersion, and this is the result. So here you see in the y-axis, you see the velocity dispersion of the clusters, and the x-axis is the age. The darker points are the clusters that are two to four million years old from SANA's study. <coughs> and the points in this corner of the plot are our observations. As, as you can see, we do observe a trend of radial velocity dispersion with age, which is consistent with our hypothesis that massive stars form in wide orbits and then harden in a few million years. Now, of course, I'm very aware that what I'm showing you is very low number statistics. So where do we go from here? First of all, I would like to prove our results that M17 is lacking closed binaries. So for this, I have a program with X Shooter and uh, ISIS in the, in the William Herschel Telescope where we are observing many more massive stars in M17 with several epochs so that we can characterize the binarity start first start. Also, if what I'm telling you is true that they are born in wide orbits, you, we should find these wide companions that I'm claiming there exist. So we have also a program with sphere, NATO, and gravity to find these uh, companions around massive stars. Third, we need more points in this plot, so uh, I would like to do a survey of massive star forming regions to be able to do these measurements more precisely. And fourth, we need to characterize the disks. <laughs> I learned today that this is not so easy, but we have an ALMA uh, program where we will observe some of these disks, see we, if we can measure maybe the masses, see if, if they are massive enough to harden a binary, for example. Yeah, to finish, uh, I would like to give you led you with these conclusions. We found a population of stars that is actually very young and massive enough that we can compare it with older populations of massive stars. And second, massive stars seem to be born in wide orbits and then harden. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to...
So, uh, so the velocity of the explosion you, you measure, that's from all stars? Mm-hmm. No, for just the mass stars? stars. Yeah. Have you, can you, have you thought about measuring also the gas kinematics and comparing that to see if there's, if they're similar and so maybe it's also to that as, as the, the gas disperses and the velocity of the explosion increases? The, the velocity expression in the stars also increase? Yeah, so we have thought about it. We have not done it yet mm-hmm. because normally surveys that observe gas are saturated in these things. Uh, so that's our problem. We, we would need to do special studies. And I have one more question. Do you see uh, a lot of like mass segregation from the mass of stars? Because also mass segregation, if you don't see that they're mass segregated, then it could ex- mean that there's less Interaction, so like say as a function of age, you see less mass segregation. Uh, it could be a sign that there's less dynamical interactions, and as you see more mass segregation, then you have more dynamical interactions that can explain the, you know, that you can have multiple systems that then harden from that. Have you guys thought about looking at that uh, to kind of see how the velocity dispersion compares with, let's say, the mass the, the mass segregation of these clusters? So by mass separation, you mean that the massive stars, stars are in the middle. Yeah. So actually, uh, in these clusters that we have here, they are color coded by, by temperature. Okay. So the blue ones are the hottest and massive, more, most massive ones. So okay. like at simple side, you don't seem to have any any correlation of the massive stars that being in the middle. What about as a function of age at all? It's so I haven't done that, that's a good idea. Because I, I think that, that can then give, because you would expect that with mass segregation that you'd have more interactions with the massive stars, yeah, yeah. pushing out the little mass stars. And then that could cause the binaries to harden with time as they seek towards the center. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a good idea. I, I, I'll definitely do that. Something that I'm not sure if is if the time scales for dynamical interactions are so short that you can harden a binary from in, in a few million years. So like yeah. the, the cluster dynamical interaction. I well I think the estimated time scales are mostly assuming low mass stars and so on. Yeah. And so maybe it's a lot faster for because you see mass segregation and it's still yeah, not yeah. people still aren't sure if that is a product of the formation. Mm-hmm. Process, or if it's just an evolutionary thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, thanks. Michel. Yeah. So when you say um, white binaries, what is the initial, what's the initial separation? I'm talking about a few thousand AU, ten thousand AU. Uh, it's a few hundred AU. A few hundred. Okay. Yeah. And then they tie. And then they tie them to be spectroscopic binaries, which is. Uh, a few tens of AU or a few AU, depending on the masses. I think I have a... Well, yeah, go ahead. So I have this plot here, I don't want to be held. So AU is up there. The binaries, the, the spectroscopic binaries, which are the 70% of, of closed binaries that I talk about, are spectroscopic. So it's actually a few AU. And then I am talking about a hundred okay, yeah. or so. Yeah, it was more by a fraction of ten. Thanks. So maybe more of a technical question. So you're showing these HR diagrams of the stars, and um, these are massive YSOs, so they should have ex- substantial extinction, and they should be different from star to star. How, how do you? Yeah. So we individually by fitting SED. So because we we are lucky enough that we have the, the whole age to the range. We fit SEDs individually, so we model we model the stars first with a with a photo photospheric code, which is the fast wind. And then you have an idea of the temperature that the star should have based on the on the lines. And then with that temperature, we model the SEDs and we estimate individually the SEDs. Are there any more questions? If not, let's thank Maria again. <laughs> so now comes the discussion of the unconferences. How would you like to do this best? Should people come and approach? Yeah, I have, I have, I have a plan. So there is a plan. There is a plan. plan. It's always good. It's always good to have a plan. It's very dark. Yeah, yeah, it's very dark. No. Uh, okay. I updated the conference team.
with the actual unconferences that we had. So we have these lovely graphics here. Um, and then, so the idea is that we will get the person who was the chair of each one to just come up and give us a quick summary. And uh, if your group used a Google anything, uh, you can go here and you can just open it from here and show us whatever you want to show us. Okay? Is that clear, everybody? Who was especially the chair? Okay, so we'll start here. And so the first one was Dick Disc Polarization B Fields. And by the way, people didn't put their names up when they suggested these things, so you know who you are. But tomorrow, please put your name when you make a suggestion. So, Ian, do you want? I don't have anything to show. Okay, that's fine. Just leave it like that. Let's see. How much time do we have for this whole thing? 30 minutes? 30 minutes, okay. So, like, five minutes per person max. Okay, so we talked a bit about uh, disk polarization, and uh, um, so this is rapidly uh, um, changing field. So the first time we detected disk polarization was in um, 2014, and with Alma doing the first disk polarization in 2015, 2016, and on. Um, the main thing that we've main feature we've seen with doing polarization in disk. So this is at sub millimeter and millimeter wavelengths is that it does not match any kind of physical magnetic field that you might expect. Um, um, at least, not obviously, especially at, uh, um, if the disk is a little bit optically thick, and it looks like it's the polarization signal we're getting is from scattering at uh, about 870 microns. Um, but at 3 millimeters, we get a drastically different polarization morphology. Um, and there's a few mechanisms that have been suggested that work uh, that might cause the polarization at three millimeters, and none of those seem to work. At eight centi microns, we're thinking scattering is definitely working. And as far as uh, um, what's sorry, I got, I'm going to bring up my notes here. But as far as uh, so, so the big problems that we have is. Uh, um, for scattering, we, we see scattering, um, the, the grain size tells you uh, how polarized the signal should be. And from the grain size, uh, we are seeing that uh, we only should have grains that are about 100 microns in size, but a lot of people have been suggesting that grains in disk are millimeter in size. And if they're millimeter in size, the polarization signal we're calculating doesn't work. Uh, the, doesn't create the polarization levels we would expect. So that's the problem that we're seeing with scattering models. And then at the uh, longer wavelengths, at three millimeters, where the morphology is really different, uh, we don't have a model that works with that at all. There's no theoretical model that seems to work. And so um, um, moving forward, I think there's some things that we really need to worry about when it comes to just dis polarization. And that's uh, we need to worry about substructure. There's a lot of gaps. And so it's just part of that's pushing to higher and higher resolution. You have an optical depth effect. Um, the gaps are optically thick. The, the, sorry, the gaps are optically thin, and the, the bands are, uh, um, the bright bands are optically uh, are thick. And so uh, when you move to higher resolution, and, um, and the other things that we kind of discussed is maybe try other line polarization, although um, we have done line polarization in Zeeman and, and GK effect. It looks like none of that's getting detected right now. And so um, it looks like what we really need to do is push multi-wavelength, move to higher resolution, do a lot more disk. It's a very time intensive, but we need a bigger sample for theorists to actually accurately model things. So uh, yeah, that's kind of the main things. Thanks. Yeah, we have like a, we have the G-Doc. Okay, Wait, I'll get in there. That's nice. Oops, sorry. Ah. Which, uh, chemical tracer this one? Yes. This one? Yeah. Oh, yours. Oh, my, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I was dumb enough uh, suggesting this session because I was very curious, but I don't know anything about it, uh, about chemical traces. And I was hoping for um, some some expert in our room. But um, 
So let me try to do my very best here as a chair. Um, so the reason why I'm interested, why I was interested in this was um, infall and infall and outflow. I was thinking in the context of protostars because we have the filamentary structures in giant molecular clouds, and um, it seems to be that there are there, there are a lot of filamentary motions, which also corresponds then that you have some signs of, of infalling motions also at different times. And um, outflows I was particularly interested in um, the outflow from from uh, from young disks, as they are also a sign of uh, magnetization, and so you know, in that way also an indirect. Um, measure of it. So then um, what we talked about then was um, um, how you, we talked about the gas kinematics in, in disk and um, <laughs> Liz talked about, um, presented her work briefly in the in a summary before, so have a look at her poster um, where C80 no is a pretty good f um, tracer for the for the outflow for the low density gas because it's um, it's not as optically thick as, um, as uh, CO, this is in the context of disks. Um, so I won't I think, think I will go to detail of the of the model because we, we heard this before. Um, then uh, we're thinking more about so what is a good trace of infall in the context of star formation? Then um, based on some preliminary work by uh, Jaime Pineda, we we're talking about HC3N and um, why that might be a good tracer. We um, by, while doing that, we found this this kind of nice summary there um, where you can see the link up up there. It's, I think it's a very biased uh, summary, but still you have like forever for diff you have different traces and you can see what they are tracing uh, for, for dense gas, infalling gas, outflowing gas. So feel free to have a look. Um, we briefly mentioned um, NH2CHO for for shocked regions and um, for the outflows. Also, still in the context of, of protostars, so I call it um, SIO, SIO2 because that's um, that's that is like a common and good tracer because of um, Dust sputtering. Um, then we kind of shift shift gears a bit and talked about about infall in a, in a, in a larger context. So in the context of um, stellar um, of the towards clusters, so like on parsec scales. And um, Perry presented his um, briefly presented his work or talked what he's what that absorption might be a good mechanism there uh, for to use for 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 your work with uh, um, Sophia. And he he mentioned then like that ammonia the ammonia line at 1.2 terahertz might be a might be a good tracer there um, for future observations. So anything? Do, did I miss anything else? Maybe Catherine, you want to add anything? No. Okay. Thanks. We definitely want to ask questions. By the way, if you want to yes. Questions. So, thank you. So now it's about the dynamical star formation, and as Alyssa phrased it, it's the, was the part one of that. Maybe we could do part two later. So we had from these parts, uh, in the beginning, we really started discussing whether some people would defend the virial equilibrium or whether nobody would defend this, and we're all on the dynamical picture. And in the end, we went a little bit also to the tracers and how to do this. And there were some people still, still kind of defending. So, so the, the virial equilibrium, what, what I kind of also took with, with this, there are maybe two different definitions. So there is no real equilibrium of the clouds, but one can still describe these clouds with a virial per equilibrium if one takes the simplest form of um, kinetic and gravitational energy and that then those things even, that, that was a terminology which I, which was kind of new, that they can be in viral equilibrium and still collapsing, so that the, the parameter is describing this. So therefore, observationally, the error bars are too large, that's tough, but from the simulation side, there are ways that one could, could use this terminology still in the framework of describing these collapsing clouds. By the way, it's not just me talking. If you have other things about this, please chime in. Yeah, so, so we discussed that for a while, but I think in general there is agreement all these things are very dynamical, collapsing, contracting structures. I think there, there is general agreement about this. In the very end, then, we moved a little bit to how to trace these, and I showed data from um, different density tracers where we measure velocity gradients, and these velocity gradients increase quantitatively if we go from low-density tracers to higher-density tracers. So, so this is just a 
measurement that kinematics increase with density. We then discussed that one could test that in simulation. That is definitely true. And in the end, Diderik made suggestion how we could also measure the mass flow. I must admit that I haven't still understood this fully. I have to talk. Okay, so that, that's something where he made suggestion how to measure these mass flows. So we, we still, as Alyssa just said, there will be another unconference about that part. But uh, if one wants to make the general summary, yes, it's a globally dynamically collapsing system. But to trace this, to observe this, this is the much tougher question. Please, others, chime in on that description. <laughs> it was this one, right. Rahul Shetty made this, this plot that I like a long time ago, uh, where he basically showed that if you take really simple things, like down here, uh, that you can calculate a meaningful variable parameter, and that the more complex you make the structure, that, that moves to the right along this abstract axis here. Um, and then, you know, here's the variable parameter plus surface term. So, you know, this is the real variable theorem, right? And so if you add in more and more terms, you know, so here's, I can't, I don't have my glasses, surface terms, magnetic terms, and then this and says all, all physics. physics. So this would be this entire color spectrum here. Um, and, and uh, you know, for a very simple structure, I think it's still possible to measure these things, but the more complicated the geometry gets, the more impossible it is observationally to measure these things. So I think part of the conclusion we came to was we really need to use the virial analysis as a kind of diagnostic rather than a judgment um, about what's actually happening with something. And the, the, the continued part tomorrow will be to flesh out Diedrich's uh, suggestion that we could measure mass flows um, in observations guided by simulations, and I'll just leave it there. Oh, it's on the chart for tomorrow. So who's next? Sorry. You still have to agree how you calculate Sorry? You still have to agree how you calculate Oh, yeah. 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 This the confusion, especially on a molecular cloud scale, comes from the fact that people do different things. They do different things, and they use different boundaries, which was a big part of the conversation. So, oh, look, we're done. <laughs> We uh, could make 10 seconds over time. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is there more? <laughs> no, no, I just wonder whether the other I always like to cut myself off. <laughs> anyway. All right. Is there then. more from. Oh, wait, one thing. When you're saying dynamic and uh, it's constantly collapsing, do you mean it's both collapsing and expanding, or is it, does it go both ways in this dynamic picture? Or well, so, uh, so all these. I was, in my picture, thinking more of the collapse and the dynamic from large scale when the clouds assemble and then. But simultaneously, feedback happens, and you, you push stuff outwards. This gives you a low star formation efficiency. This we haven't discussed, but obviously that, that's part of the game, which has to be included in the overall discussion of the grid. But this we <coughs> so much in the discussion. Is this um, so we were talking about the perennial problem of trying to measure disk masses. Um, this started with a brief review of sort of the current ways that we can measure masses in protoplanetary disks. So the first one is using the continuum mission, where you just assume it's optically thin, you assume some temperature, you get a dust mass, and you times that by 100 um, to get a gas mass. Of course, this is fraught with uncertainties. We don't really know the opacity of these grains. We don't know really the temperature. Um, of the grains, so we're really underestimating the masses this way. Uh, if we want to try and measure the gas component directly, people have been trying to use CO isotope logs, um, but again, people have shown that when you're trying to model the CO um, integrated emission, you find very low gas masses that give you incredibly high um, dust to gas ratios um, of, wait, yeah, high dust to gas ratios, um, so equivalently low gas to dust ratios. Anyway, it's very complicated. <laughs> um, and we don't think they're very good anyway. Um, so people have also tried to use HD, which we think is a more accurate tracer of H2, which it is chemically. The problem is here that to model the emission coming from HD, you need a very precise temperature structure because the energy levels are so widely spaced that very small differences in your assumed temperature lead to very big differences in the emission. Um, so there's sort of the three main ways that people have been measuring disk masses. They all give very different results. Um, people really don't know what to believe at the moment. 
So we then started talking about ways in which we could measure the disk mass, not from how bright lines are, but how the disk mass will actually influence how we observe the disk and other traces. So we talked about a really nice set of papers from Diana Powell recently, where she was showing that you could potentially measure the surface density of the gas based on how quickly the grains are migrating through the disk. The idea being that a more massive disk, the grains will couple more efficiently to the gas, and this will mean that they move in towards the disk center much faster. Um, so this is a really interesting idea, uh, firstly because it doesn't require any sort of chemistry in there, so that makes it a lot easier in one sense. But then you also make a lot of assumptions about your green properties and how they're growing. Um, so we had a really nice discussion about the uncertainties that are folded in here um, and how that would affect the final mass products that we get from that. Because the disks that she's applied this method to, they all seem to have very high masses, close to the gravitationally unstable limit. So that's potentially worrying. Um, but it's also a nice way to um, maybe verify some of these other methods that we've got. We had then also thought about trying to look at the size, sort of the vertical extent of these disks. Very simply, you would imagine that if you had a very massive disk, it should be bigger. So you should be able to observe um, a higher emission surface from, say, scattered light or some of the molecular emission. Um, so that's a, another nice idea. Um, is that my time? Kind of. No, kind of. Um, and we also looked at trying to use um, non-LTE excitation from things like CN or C2H molecules in order to constrain the volume density of H2 at specific locations, which you can then extrapolate back to the disk um, surface density. Um, and we finally had a discussion on how to get the best temperature structures for your disks, because obviously everything that involves interpreting emission lines, you need the temperature in order to back out the density. Um, so we reviewed a few different ways that people were measuring temperatures in disks. Um, particularly this nice paper by Christoph Pont, who showed how you can empirically derive the heights of the emission from different lines and then back out a 2D temperature structure from that. Um, so I think that covered everything. Did anyone else have anything to add? No? That was it. Sarah here, I think that's the next one. Wow. Ah, there she is. That's yours. You can use that if you want. Yep. So we had a nice tis, slowly, discussion inspired by these observations that cloud scale observables like surface densities here and also velocity dispersions are correlated with the large-scale environment. So I was interested firstly in how the large-scale environment influences the cloud scales and for people's ideas on this and also how the cloud scales influence the environment in turn. So, Padim um, gave him a nice overview of his work of the cycling of gas um, slowly, between high volume intensities and low velocity um, dispersions and then up to higher velocity dispersions and lower densities. And so um, the idea I had of this, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the style of heat back will drive the gas more in this direction and then Slowly, the gravity and dynamics is more um, responsible for gas that comes back into the clouds. But, yeah. Yep. The, there's a list of processes and they all, uh, the contribution of different processes like 
feedback or <coughs> dynamical pollution mm -hmm. of gas between phases. It depends on the large scale, uh, large scale within within the, within the galaxy. So for example, these plots they just show uh, the same diagram, so which which is very similar to what is in observations. It's a sigma as a function of density, and uh, it changes with the galaxy environment. So the, the bottom plot is closer to the disk center, and the upper plot is on the outskirts. And different parts of this diagram are populated by different processes. So, for example, in the inner parts, it's uh, large scale turbulence driven by star feedback in these simulations, at least. And at large distances, it's spiral arms. This may give <coughs> some insights into what what may be different in this uh, observed galaxies mm -hmm. where the loss dispersion is a function of certain things. Mm -hmm. And then we added this uh, um, square to indicate where CO clouds are actually able to be observed, which connected to Melanie's work, um, which was on the archive this morning or yesterday morning, I think. Yes, yesterday. Yep, um, which was on the archive this morning about how there's a threshold in the average molecular hydrogen surface density above which the clouds are coupled to galactic <coughs> so dynamics. And then um, we had an aside where there's this spreadsheet for the different feedback. Oh, okay. Did I stop? Okay. Um, shall I click this? Different feedback processes. Where? Um, and this was started by Joao and this uh, about two years ago, um, and no certified students can explain that they would like um, us to here. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and, uh, and, and this was connected to our discussion because there are schedules on which the feedback is um, as the most important. Um, and then that takes us to a possible conclusion. Oh, sorry, just back. Oh, where is the article? Um, I think we might be in group one. Oh, sorry. Okay, I've lost this. Galaxy yeah, time. This one. Um, yes. No, so, um, the possible conclusion I came up with is that it is an even useful thing to talk about the environmental scales and the cloud scales, or if we can, should consider um, the hierarchy of densities instead. I think that's tied in also to this part two hierarchy discussion tomorrow morning. So yeah, um, tomorrow morning are we starting here? Yeah, it's the same. It's the exact same thing. Right, but we have to. We didn't bring the big white sheets for people to write down there. Just tomorrow morning at the very beginning of we coffee. We can use the board, or we can write it on the board. Yeah, the I mean, take a picture. Take a picture. Yeah, because if you have ideas overnight, we can just write them right through the coffee in the morning when you come in here. So hey, there's one more. Uh, Molecules. Who did molecules? And is there a Google thing? Somebody talked about molecules. Maybe. Who else was there? He, is he he, he's not here. Oh, okay. Is anybody here who was there? Simon, did you want to say anything? <coughs> molecules aren't involved in the function, right? <laughs> Basically, the bottom line. Okay. So okay. Yeah, I think it was not, yeah, molecular cooling is not important for controlling the soft pressure rate. 
for controlling the star formation rate. He said molecular cooling is not important for controlling the star formation rate. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with that statement. I'm just repeating. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have an opinion. Okay, so that one doesn't have notes, so we can't. Oh wait, does it? There's an objection no, here of the notion. There's an objection. Oh, good. Here. So in simulations, it's used as a tracer. So uh, we. Uh, there's observational evidence that uh, in observed normal forming galaxies, um, uh, star formation is uh, well traced by molecular gas. So the relation between surface densities on Kalaparsic scale are, is almost linear. And then it's just used as an empirical model for star formation in galaxy simulations where neither uh, where star formation can be resolved. So then this means if, uh, if uh, then it's the question whether a modeling, a, a separate modeling of star formation is important or not. Is this correct? Or? <laughs> But it's very dangerous to then take that same thing and extrapolate it to very different metallicities. And if you do that, we will get the wrong answer. Um, we, we've established this very well in simulations. So you shouldn't be using a star formation model that depends on H2. You should be using a star formation model which depends on the cold dense gas. The solar metallicity this gives you the same answer. But at very different metallicities, it does not necessarily give you the same answer. That's Really the Sounds like this is a little repeat that. Um, so just to remind you of what Anna said, this is where we're going for dinner um, uh, and bowling. And uh, I think we should all try to bowl with people we don't know very well, just as my own personal suggestion. I'm terrible at chemical bowling. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, right, just so you know, Canopy Bowling is like a historical New England thing. So, for those of you who have not done it, this is like kind of a museum experience going to this bowling place. Um, but anyway, uh, I think we are adjourned. Is there anything else? Uh, no, but um, you guys should definitely. Uh, so, like, it's walkable from the hotel. I'm not sure where everyone's staying. Uh, many of you are staying at Porter Square. So, um, yeah, from there it's only about 10 minutes. It's like a 10 minute, 15 minute walk. So, should we, is everyone, so raise your hand if you're going to walk over from Porter Square. So, I would recommend, are you guys all at the hotel? I mean, I would say you guys could just all meet together and walk together. We'll be there. 